that uh, any sudden unexpected death, mm -hmm. we respond mm -hmm. and we examine, we investigate the circumstances around your death. And, and, and is it true the publicity of this cost you your job? Yes. How so? Uh, because of, uh, of the controversies uh, related to the how much information should be uh, uh, released, I have always have felt that people has a right to know, mm -hmm. uh, especially that the uh, coroner and medical examiner's investigation is an official investigation. The result of the investigation should be a uh, release to uh, the people in the community, mm -hmm. and uh, so I did. Uh, naturally, I understand there is a considerable pressure and complaints from the uh, uh, Hollywood community as well as some of the people, friends. So, so you're saying that the, the, the Hollywood community did not like what you would come up with and, uh, and said, well, wait, you're going you're gonna to maybe tarnish the image of our stars here. Uh, we can't have this. We, we need somebody who can, can go along with the, uh, the, the natural cause excuse. I think so. You think so? But I, I do understand the reason why that mm -hmm. the family is to suffer a great deal of pain of losing uh, friends. Well, that, that's right, but you have a job to do. Yes. Okay. Now, let's talk about Natalie Wood, first of all, because Natalie Wood, as well, we first gear reports, was that she fell off a boat, drowned. And you don't think it happened that way? Actually, our study indicated that instead of her falling a uh, in water directly, the based on available forensic evidence, we believe that she might have untied the uh, dinghy, and uh, because of a unstable situation in the uh, the boat, uh, she fell in the water. Instead, uh, she swam back to the uh, boat. She hung onto the dinghy. She made a heroic decision to swim to the. Uh, uh, the beach, which was about a mile or over a mile, uh, mile away. Uh, she was uh, nearly able to make it, except uh, she was wearing a heavy down jacket, nightgown and so forth, soaked water, weighing a time of investigation, weighs about 30 pounds, prevented her to climb up to, to be board. able to get on board. Well, how do, how do you determine that, though? How do you determine that she has to uh, the dinghy. How do you get the dinghy in there and, and that she, you're trying to retrace all that? How can you tell from we forensic are, evidence? We are a medical detective, uh. putting all the evidence together. The, uh, when you look at the uh, uh, dinghy, there were uh, scratch marks on this uh, starboard side. Mm -hmm. She has bruises on the inside of the arms, which the pattern matches with the, uh, the protruded objects uh, in the dinghy. On the dinghy. The key and to the engine was still off position or was still inside. And this, uh, only the reasonable explanation would be that she have tried to uh, come on board. In, the, in addition, the current was uh, coming from north to south and the strong wind from east to west. That only one reason that the dinghy was found on the beach was that uh, not there would personally swam with a dinghy. I'll be done. All right, well, we're going to take a little break here, but we're going to come back and talk about the death of John Belushi on The Late Show after these words. Stay with us. The Late Show is brought to you by Renew Disinfecting Solution from Bosch & Long. Now you can disinfect and even rinse your lenses all with the same solution. Renew makes living with contacts easier. Welcome back to the show. We are here with the corner to the stars, Dr. Thomas Noguchi, who has a new book called Unnatural Causes. Uh, we want to talk about John Belushi because the first reports were that he died of a heart attack. And then he comes to you and you reveal the, uh, the true cause. Actually, I responded at a scene because... Uh, uh, the examination of the remain alone is not sufficient. Medical detective would respond to the scenes as I have uh, attended the scene. I thought there's uh, maybe a heart attack. There was no uh, uh, sign of a foul play. But uh, as uh, I squeezed the arm, the right arm, so I saw a drop of blood came out. And it was the uh, same as they did on the left side. And again, it's a small drop of blood came out. I knew 
The did you see it? Did you see a mark there? No, That's why I did he's... not see it. Oh, you did not see a mark. I you just squeezed see... it. Yeah. Uh, that must be a routine for me. Just simply, I uh, feel the need to be done. As I saw the blood and I knew the cause of death would be something related to the injection of the drugs. Chemical study indicated that the drug was a cocaine and heroin. And the question is not so much what cause of death, but was that did he give injection by himself? or did the uh, uh, injection was given someone else. Yeah. This uh, is the area we call signature of uh, uh, needle marks. And how do you determine that? Well, it's a... Uh, uh, I guess the angle, maybe. You'd, you'd take that into consideration? Ex excellent, excellent, that's right. Uh, the, uh, if we are to inject this uh, needle into the own vein, how awkward it is. You don't have complete control. It tends to have a more acute angle and the damage of tissue more often. Just to see a nurse in the hospital gives an injection uh, because of the, she has complete control. Uh -huh. She uses a medically clean needle and damage is very minimal. And what did you determine from this? Well, it's, uh, I was removed the day that I Actually, the day that was so controversial cases, I did not have a complete examination done on the case, but um, I felt this... Uh, Who took the, you off the case? Who took you off the case? Well, following its uh, controversy of the uh, William Holden, not really well, and John Belushi came, uh, and uh, they, I was uh, removed that day. Ah, okay. All right. How, because they didn't want you to discover the, uh, the truth, of the matter. Is that what you think? I think a uh, politician must have been too much uh, uh, that he could take, mm, perhaps. Okay. How about Marilyn Monroe? Uh, that was a, that was a, too many sleeping pills is what I think we heard at that time. And you were involved in that case. It's actually 25 years ago. I was a junior member in the department. I was assigned to uh, conduct the examination. Uh, the uh, complete autopsies and uh, they indicated that uh, uh, the cause of death would uh, more likely suicide by taking a large amount of uh, sleeping pills. There are two kinds. Chemical test of the blood showed uh, nambutal, large quantity, and uh, hydrochlorohydrate, another sleeping pills. And they, uh, we closed the case as a probable suicide. Shortly after the inquiry came, there was someone thought this was maybe a murder. And uh, since that, uh, my examination indicated that the stomach was empty. However, I felt this the uh, changes I saw found in the stomach would be consistent with the suicide by taking large number of uh, sleeping pills. But the uh, controversy continues. Uh, as um, the controversy seems to stems on the area of a uh, relationship with the Kennedy brothers. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this reason, in 1982, the district attorney's office conducted a very thorough investigation. Even, they reopened the case. Yeah, they opened the case. Okay. And even asked me to, uh, again, come to the, his office to uh, uh, go over the, each steps of the examination. They concluded, in order to uh, have a murder to be done, it takes an uh, in-house or uh, placing uh, all, uh, all of the personnel in the department of the coroner as well as the police department. It's impossible to, uh, to do so and uh, the staff wasn't large enough? Is that what you're saying? The staff wasn't large enough to, to get a conclusion uh, about that? Well, it's uh, actually it's, uh, the step-by-step -step analysis that DA felt this uh, uh, murder was unlikely. Uh, okay. However, the last two years or so, someone, I think ambulance driver, came up and saying that, there was, uh, that he was the one who removed the uh, Mary Monroe while she was still alive to the Santa Monica Hospital mm -hmm. and uh, bring her back again to this own 
home. She, they took the ambulance, picked her up, took her from the home, went to Santa Monica to Hospital, Santa then took her back took to her, her house? Back. That's how he said. I felt this, uh, that changes the circumstances surrounding a death. And, uh, it's I not like come... she forgot something. No, no not at all. It's uh, strange. So I wanted to have official body reopen the case. However, however local uh, agency decided not to do so. And they have jurisdiction to, to shut the case if they want? Yes. Okay, so there's another unanswered question. Now, let me ask you about something that we have coming up on Tuesday. We have a special with Dr. Jeffrey McDonald, the man who was accused of murdering his family and children. Um, been in prison for seven years. You don't think that he did it. You don't think that he could have done it. Can you tell us why? He was accused and convicted for the murder of the, uh, of the family. Uh, the evidence that the reason for the conviction was uh, three key forensic evidence. Pajama top, blood stains, and the fibers found in the, uh, uh, the different rooms. Each one of the evidence do not have, uh, in other words, there was a scene was disturbed, mixing up, and there's a great possibility, the theory that the government had developed, it could be wrong. Further, I had a chance to examine the uh, pictures uh, taken at scene and autopsy. The wound patterns and the degree of the bleeding indicate to me they were done by more than one person, more likely four or five people. You can tell that, that more than one person uh, was doing the damage here? How, can you, how do you do that? The forensic evidence that it can only lead to the such conclusion because one person was to carry four or five different weapons. And, for example, I speak, the, the paring knife and the ligature, rope like this, and club. Uh, whenever injury to be sus uh, sustained, and you have to leave this, uh, you cannot hold four or five weapons in one hand. That's right, sure. Uh, to leave this uh, weapon, bloody weapon, to the floor or the table leaves uh, markings. Mm. There is no such. Uh -huh. Interesting. This is fascinating, forensics and, the, and becoming a, a medical detective, um, like, like Quincy, like, which is one of my, used to be one of my favorite shows, uh, is like the, uh, it's, it's just a fascinating process you go through. Yes. Now, you've written a new book. I want to tell people about that. It's called Unnatural Causes, and uh, this is Dr. Thomas Noguchi. I hope you'll come back sometime. Thank you. Dr. Thank Thomas, you. thank you very much. We're going to be coming right back, so stay with us, folks. Coming up next, Spin Magazine publisher Bob Guccione Jr. tells us what's hot and what's not. I'm pretty certain that uh, many of you have read, you've probably read the rock and roll magazine Spin. Yeah. Yeah. It has been called the voice of a new generation, and most of that voice comes from its highly opinionated, irreverent young leader um, who says that a publication must have a point of view. You just, can't, you just can't publish fluff. Well, I want you to welcome the publisher and the editor of Spin Magazine, Bob Guccione, Jr. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Nice to be back. Now, see, people know about Spin. Well, one, one guy did. One guy did, but he was, yeah. but he was the, he's, me, yeah. he's the uh, spokesperson for that whole <laughs> section over there. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, tell me, because Spin had, uh, it almost went off. It, it was almost it was close. It was, it close. was very we close to being gone. We needed the Gucci to uh, work us out. Yeah. Uh, we were with Penthouse in the early days. We were uh, with my father. Mm -hmm. And we came to a point where we just couldn't agree, so we separated which meant I had to take the magazine physically in boxes out of the office and uh, for a while edited it in a coffee shop across the road from where I lived. I understand that you took you some know. of it out in the garbage. You yeah, kind of snuck we, uh, some of the paperwork yeah. out in, in the garbage. It was very funny because uh, we, just, we just figured, look, this magazine's going on. I knew it divinely. I don't know why. I never worried about it. I worried more about my ability to keep going than I did the magazine. It was a very, very strange thing. I knew, and I'm very religious. Mm -hmm. I went to church a couple of times just before we left Penhouse. And I, uh, yeah, it's true. Because huh. yeah. I'm sure you, you, did you go with your dad a lot? Uh, not a lot, no. Yeah. <laughs> Although he did take me the first time oh. many years ago. 
No, uh, you know, I, I just really felt that the magazine was going to continue. I knew it in my heart. So I prepared when the end was imminent at Penthouse, when that relationship was over, I prepared by taking uh, the magazine out in sacks. You know, the records we needed, the Rolodexes we needed. Uh, we left Penthouse on August 6th, and August 7th I held a press conference and said, look, you know, no hard feelings on both sides. Uh, I'm continuing, obviously Penthouse is continuing. And uh, a month or two, it was two months later, we were back on sale. Hmm. And it's going well now, isn't it? It's going very well, thank you, yeah. And the difference, uh, well, I'll let you explain the difference between you and Rolling Stone. Two, two rock and roll magazines. Well, you know, I have a lot of respect for the old Rolling Stone. The Rolling Stone of the 70s was a bastion of counterculture journalism. Uh, it set the standard for aggressive journalism. I was a young guy then, um, in my early 20s, and very, very influenced by that kind of journalism. So when in the 80s it seemed like there was none of that journalism, not just Rolling Stone had dilapidated, there was no more Crawdaddy, there was no more New Times, uh, politics had gone, Esquire had given it up, some of the other magazines that used to do it had given it up. I said, I'm going to come out with a magazine that's got a sense of humor on the one hand, is acute to new music, but also has a sense of conscience. Mm -hmm. And uh, now our uh, magazine is the only magazine, for instance, that carries an AIDS column every month. I've, I've noticed that, I, and I wanted to ask you why. There's also toxic waste that you, yeah. you talk about. Yeah, and right. this is a rock and roll magazine. I know, yeah, yeah. Well, that's either a comment on music or uh, a comment on how dangerous toxic waste is. Yeah. Uh, well, the AIDS column, for instance, is just something I feel very responsible about. I think that the readers of Spin, there's some 800,000 to a million of them. You know, not, I wish they'd all buy it. They don't. I'll tell you that up front. <laughs> 133,000 buy it and pass it to all their friends. You know, oh, I see. It's cost me a lot of money. <laughs> uh, and if I ever find the other six people, <laughs> I'll get the money back. Uh, but anyway, with about 800,000 to a million readers, you know, I think one has a responsibility. And this is an age group that perhaps is the least educated about AIDS, perhaps thinks they're invulnerable, as young people do. Uh, as I, I know I did before I turned 32. Uh, and, you know, it's, an, it's a group that's very sexually active. And AIDS is a disease about which we know almost nothing. So uh, rather than just the sensational editorial you get in something like Time or Newsweek, I wanted to run true and accurate uh, front-line reporting. Mm. And we have done every month. Now, besides that, you, the other point of view that you take is that you believe that people in music should say something with their music. I read that you're sick to death of Michael Jackson. Well, I, I must admit, I am. Yeah. Well, you are. Now, why? Yeah. <laughs> Mind you, there, there goes my chance of getting a Pepsi commercial. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping for that. You know. No, but you know, there is a, it's a great, it's a great shame when an artist as um, popular as Jackson, who has the attention of so many millions of young people, uh, decides to sell them Pepsi rather than tell them go to school. Or, uh, or, or in his songs, say something a little more literate. You know, John Cougar Mellencamp, of course, is a very serious songwriter and a great rock and roller. Mm -hmm. And he told me once, he said, it's all BS that rock stars need the money for endorsements for their tours and for their, you know, careers to go on. Because he said, you reach a certain point in your career, and obviously Jackson's there, uh, Mellencamp and Springsteen, who won't sell their songs, they're there. And there's such a momentum behind you that you can, you can always raise that money. You want to go on tour, people will give you the money to go on tour. Well, yeah, yeah, it's not like Michael no. Jackson's got to take a roommate in. No, exactly. You know? <laughs> so he's, they're, they're doing fine, and I agree. Although, they should Whitney Houston, I understand, is sharing to cut costs. You know, yeah, they are cutting costs. What do you feel about uh, magazines that take advantage of, uh, of uh, dragging John Lennon back into the headlines, or Elvis, yeah, uh, to well, get circulation, naturally? I heard what you said at the beginning of the show. And naturally, I phoned my printer and said, cancel that press run with the John Lennon expose. Because <laughs> can't have that. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I do feel that, um, and we're going to do an interview, an unpublished interview with John Lennon. It was done in 75, and uh, done by a German writer, and never published in English. Mm. Or uh, maybe not anywhere, but I know it was not done in English. And we're publishing that, because we took the view, everybody has something to say about Lennon, but he said it best himself. And I feel that dredging up the bones, is sort of a, like People Magazine is doing, and a lot of others are rushing to do, I find that sort of uh, necrophiliac. Hmm. It's like necrophilic publishing. You know, like, it's, leave me alone. Yeah. I mean, what was it? Uh, Kipling had a great thing on his uh, gravestone. He said, look, if I've amused you in life, please leave me alone now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, <laughs> who's, who's the guy who had the great epitaph? He said, I will not be back after this message. Or as Merv Griffin. I think that, no, yeah, Merv yeah, or, or Johnny says, yeah. I'll, I will yeah. not be back after this break. Yeah, yeah right, right. Yeah. All right, now you are... Uh, Besides the, the social conscious that you have, you also try to stay on top of trends. What is the, uh, I'm going to let you predict, what's the next big thing? Next big thing? Yeah. Um, I don't know. In music, I think uh, it's already here. It's the return to activism. It's Tracy Chapman, uh, Michelle Schacht, 
None of you will know Michelle Shockley. I think she's actually better than Tracy Chapman. I may mm. be irreverent to say that, but I think Michelle Shockley is really sharp. I think Tracy Chapman is very, very good, but slightly exaggerated by the void. You know, the fact that there was a vacuum and no one was saying anything, mm -hmm. along comes Tracy Chapman. Uh, you have things like the Mandela concert, which you covered here on Fox. Um, although a lot of the speeches were cut out, which is a shame, they were very, very strong speeches. You had artists like Gabriel and Little Steve and, uh, giving, you know, strong messages to the youth. The very thing I was saying earlier, mm -hmm. I think is important. I mean, rock and roll is still rock and roll. It's still outlaws and rebels and fun and, you know, it's no longer sex, drugs and rock and roll, I'll tell you that. It's less drugs and a lot less sex because uh, of all the things that will happen to you. Uh, but it is still, it's still, he says, <laughs> right. with a no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, but like a lot of people saying, I hope would happen to you. That's yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's still fun. It's still dancing. But it, it also has a message. I think that's very important. Well, it, it's been nice uh, to have you here. And continue, oh, it's been great. Continue. Good, good luck with the magazine. It's Thanks very much. Thank Bob you. Bob Thank you. All right, we'll be right back after this late show tune.